Welcome back, everyone, very quickly to the Lobster Roll Series Week 10 and to the Winter Semifinals between Randy and Randy's fan. Corona Nier has already started on Zed. And we are... I didn't realize it actually started as I started the break. That was... That was really unclear. I didn't realize that. Anyway, so Randy and his fan going for Spiders and Glow Keys, respectively, and Corona Nier with Tanks and Spiders, because that is how Zed does. Actually, Cloaky Spider is a relatively strong combo. Tanks, tanks can work if you manage to take the center. And Crow has already tried to claim the center as best they can, which is actually working out pretty well. The Glaives aren't contesting. They can't, for that matter. Six Glaives will not be able to beat two Kodas. And uh, two Kodas with defensive support. Two Kodas on their own, I think, would be an even match. But two Kodas with defensive support would not be. And, of course, Randy would want, or Randy's fan, rather, would want to take the center, not just clear it out. So yeah, we have Pro, and we have Mumble Clan. Mumble Clan being an Eren Crow. And Pro being Randy, and their fan. And if they didn't... I don't know if they would, like... I don't know if they have... I didn't check their aliases. I probably should, but I... I did not. Unless they really are just number one Randy fan. Actually, considering they just started playing, yeah, I guess they might be. Cool. Alright. Well, they're Randy's fan. And they are... I should not do anything here. This is entirely Randy fighting against Anir. And it looks like Randy is forced to retreat. Uh, so far, MumbleClan has managed to take a bit of a stronger... a bit of a stronger presence here. It's definitely pretty convincing. But we'll see how that... See how that pans out. I mean... You know, obviously they're... Oops. Obviously, this is early in the game, so... And Zed being what it is, there is opportunity to go around the sides and cause some shenanigans. Which, admittedly, Randy... Neither Randy nor Heather Fan has managed to actually you know, protect. Anyhow. With that said, Crow still... Actually falling in the center, Randy, Randy's fan with the with the slings coming in, taking out the defensive turrets. This is honestly the one thing that tank kind of does, and there's the emissaries to do that exact thing, which is hold the center. Like this big flat center bit, that is tank territory. That is what tank does best. But at the moment, tank is having a bit of a hard time. The emissary is here though, and it's it's gonna be scary. You know, damaging event a little bit. Maybe not that scary. Not yet. I mean, the problem, the thing is going to be, of course, for defensive turrets. Or the occasional glaive when it misses because radar wobble. So, given that everything's set up here, and here does have some scouting around the map to figure out what the heck's going on, but Crow is the only one really holding the line. Everything else around the map is open. It's very open, in fact. Randy or their fan could go around the sides if they... And granted, they, the presence is there in the center. Obviously, they're going to be they're gonna be worried about losing the center if not careful. Randy's commander being anything but careful. Koda's I th overextended a little bit, though. But it's still working out. I mean, Randy and their fan, they're holding on. The Redbacks are able to do enough damage to hold everything else back. Emissary should be able to take care of all the defensive turrets being built up. Help damage the commander. Randy forced to retreat. Crow able to hold the line, but at great expense, losing both Kodas, losing the ogre, basically losing everything. At this point, a near spiders are the only things keeping this really alive, honestly. That emissary is handy, but only if it's protected. And that's gonna be a tight that's gonna be a tough thing to do. The slings are coming in range. That emissary is gone. Another emissary is up, or more emissaries are on their way, but it's just the slings. They can test them. I think the range for Emissary is a little bit larger. 890? Yeah, 1120 to 890. So the Emissaries do have potential beyond what is obvious. I mean, they can, they can get to an outrange of the Slings, but that may not matter, especially as as I was saying, Pro can just come around the sides here. Mumble Clan, they have, don't have anything here. They basically have nothing set up. 
And if they pull away from the center, if they can pull Mumble Clan away from the center, then Pro is winning. Now, Anir being very smart here, only going for the absolute minimum number of Venoms they need to defend this. Keeping everything else on the front lines. So the Pro, the distraction from Pro shouldn't take everything out. The Stingers will be able to finish it off. Assuming it goes for it. So Mumble Clan still, they have the Emissaries. That is a lot. So far, Pro has not really changed up what they're doing. Just switching up to Ronin. They clearly figured out enough slings. Want to go for a bit more frontline assault. Well, skirmisher, but frontline damage. Still a little iffy. Kind of surprised. I expect to have an air switch at some point, honestly. I expect Mumble Clan to get air, or possibly. Honestly, I don't know why they haven't done this with the emissaries. But get a sparrow. Build a radar, morph to a sparrow, because the emissaries, their range far exceeds their sight. Like, case in point, take this, go here, range in the dark. So getting a sparrow would massively increase the accuracy of the emissaries, allow them to completely outrange the slings effectively, and basically let them rip everything else apart. Like, that would wreck the center completely. But I don't see any radar even having been built, let alone any sparrows being built off that. Like, it's worth noting that spiders, I mean, they're, they have radar built in. So the weavers have radar built in. There, there's there gotta be... Oh yeah, and the commander has radar built in. So there is a lot of radar. But radar isn't enough. It has wobble. Ooh, nice shot on the caretaker, though. That's a great shot, actually. That really opens things up. But again, a Sparrow, just having that little extra scouting. Although the Widow, also a good choice, actually. That Widow does open things up. Throw that in, set up scouting, use that vision to allow the Emissaries to do much. Yeah, so you can use that spot for the Emissary. Awesome. That works too. Actually, about the same cost as well. So, you know what? Kind of works out of the way. I mean, Widow has the advantage of being able to stun out the Commander... Sparrow has the advantage of being able to get out of dodge easily. Also doesn't have to worry if it, say, runs into a conjurer that happens to be coming along the side here. Although admittedly, that doesn't really matter. Actually, that, that was really helpful. I <laughs> got rid of the con- Okay, you know what? Widows are just better. No, Sparrow's not worth it. Widows are just better. Forget what I said earlier. Widows really are just strictly better in this case. Like they're better for spotting, they have other tool they have utility for revealing cloaked units. They can obviously go to the commander. They have the position to, but yeah, this <laughs> Ken! Oh! Didn't even reveal the widow in the process. Just got decloaked. I mean, obviously they're not, oh, there must be a widow here, but still they can't target it easily. Oh, that's gotta hurt. At the same time, a near over to the southeast, sending some venoms up in an undefended expansion. Getting a free metal extractor. Could probably get the everything else too, honestly. So Crow and Anir just wrecking up the place. Presumably they would have chosen this map as well, so they had an idea of what to do. Same time though, Randy's not taking this line down, coming in over the southeast, but Anir is already prepared. I mean, gotta say, 2000 attrition, that's worth a lot, as it's very clearly being made to pay off. Randy's commander too far forward. Does not have jump available. The Venoms are not going to last too long against the Redbacks. Forced retreat again in the center of the map. Tremor in with the Emissaries with the Spotter Ven or Spotter Widows or Spotter Widow. Unfortunately, the other one has gone down. But still, Tremor on top of everything else, just cracking everything open. And Anir still able to defend the Northwest while taking out the Southeast. Crow is... Pretty much just here to hold the line once again. As at the beginning of the game, but now with much, much better tools to do so. And also without a massive threat from Pro. Still Randy slowly but surely setting up their assault to take out the southwest. And Anir not doing much beyond that on the, over to the southeast. There's a lot of room they can move and over in order to take everything else out here. Crack things over in the back. That would allow for Crow to push in the front, get a pincer off that, and probably take the game, honestly. If nothing else, it would force back all these forces here, which would then allow Anir to move... Although, 
No, never mind. I see what Nier's doing. We're gonna push in here, try to push along the side. Pincer from the center, like between Crow's force in the center and these forces taking out Randy's assault. Pincer everything in the corner over the side here. Flank out all these skirmishers, although they'll probably reposition time, but still, flank them all out while pincering them here. Killing the army in this box after killing the commander. Nicely done. And that should take the game from there. Randy and their fan don't seem to have any counter strategy coming in here. Slings are set up to get rid of what effectively is a red herring assault. Because the real threat is the center. Also, a bunch of fleas being built up. I'm not sure if that's a real threat. I think it's more just, again, more spotting from the emissaries. Extra damage. Distracting. Distracting phantoms. And screening for phantoms. Useful tool, but not the way to win. Although, oh, surprisingly, not going for that pincer. Not going up the hill. Actually, I guess that kind of makes sense. That is an uphill... That is literally an uphill battle. What I'm surprised by, though, is Anir is not trying to take out these slings. Like, attacking them directly is going to be a safe move. Still, though, that does mean that Randy's fan is distracted over the side. They are not helping the front lines. And honestly, those slings would be helpful against the emissaries. At this point, that's that's a useful tool and, and is not here. And now we are seeing Anir's forces are regrouping. Not going for the pincer, just going for the regroup. But it works out nonetheless. Still a little iffy, but again, the emissaries are the main assault force. Everything else here is just a spotter or a support unit. Emissaries are the real story. Then from the Manir has retreated with their main force. It looks like they're going for regroup push. And unfortunately for them, they are forced to defend. Oh, don't go through the water. Don't go through the water. They're not going through the water, but they are they are forced back. Randy at least able to to have something of a distraction available for them. It's not enough. I mean, clearly it's just not enough. There's really no front line left for a pro. And now the forces come in here. Redback's able to get in quite a lot of damage. Knight's not going to be enough to take it out. And really, the defenses aren't in position much either. Oh, of course, Mumble Clan coming in. And here with the Weavers, adding insult to injury. Getting a spider plate as well, just to get even more Redback Venom. Or more Redbacks, just pure Redback, not even Venom. Get more Redbacks, maybe more Recluses. As this attack continues unabated there is i don't think there's anything left like if you look at the actual values for the units here for the teams it's yeah 13 4 to 4000 it's this is not happening mumble clan has really taken this they, they've convincingly won this i'm trying to see if there's anything that randy or their fan could do but i'm kind of drawing a blank looking at the salt forces here there is no real linchpin. The Tremor's helping, but it's kind of done its job. Like, it's thinned out the opposing forces. It got rid of the defenses. There's not a whole lot else that's going to be causing problems. So I don't see a whole lot Pro can do specifically. Not to mention it's way in the back lines. But yeah, it did its job. That's helpful a little bit. I mean, it's continuing to attack, getting rid of this expand or this firebase over here. But again, the real story is just Anir is everywhere, and Crow's backing them up. Randy throws in the towel. I think Randy's fan will follow suit for shortly, and there it is. Anir and Crow pulling it out, taking taking the win, and moving on to the winner's finals. Same time, though, it looks like we have one more match left. Not entirely sure how far along that is. Let's see. We have... This match should have started by now, so it'd probably be finished pretty soon. Okay, yeah, it's been up for 29 minutes. Though it wasn't Ackland Wastelands. I suppose I should check it out just to see what's going on. I don't know. I don't want to mess up the video. Oh, wait. What? This isn't right at all. Join the wrong battle. Uh... 
Guess I might as well. Kind of regret taking the break where I did. All right, well, let's just watch this match as it comes. A little unsure about how this is going to work. But hey, it's going to be something at least, so... Let's see, Spider... Spider Cloaky on... Cloaky... Cloaky Rover, and so far it looks like GBC is... Well, the start of the match at least. And in territory again, going for that northeast. Pretty convincingly digging it. Not going for the southwest as much though, because southeast has got a little bit more presence around there. Very quickly capturing that. And so far though, it's uh, still GBC taking that south that north or that southwest very quickly. Some assault in the northeast, but it's not much. Front lines have Okay, so the front line's getting taken as a, something of a push. Southeast, yeah, definitely going for the slow push. Slow pushing into the southwest, and we'll be able to take that out pretty convincingly. That economy is the important thing to grab, and Southeast taking the northeast as well. Kingstad's commander slowly but surely setting up for this. And why are they building urchins? What a curious thing to do. Ah, GBC overextending a little bit in the front lines, trying to find a way through. But it's looking iffy. Looking very iffy right now. Southeast. Now they've got the Southwest taken out. That that is done. That is gone. Northwest has been split in half. I mean, honestly, this this map has actually basically gotten split all the way down the middle diagonally. But with the Southwest being taken, this giant spider force ripping apart everything that's been built up by Flap. It's actually looking pretty strong right now. Flap able to just divide out all these forces, take out a bunch of raptors. Losing a lot in the process, though. And the Redbacks being the main loss. Fortunately, a bit of a suicide mission and not a whole lot of damage dealt. Fortunately, not managing to capture this as well, so it will be retaken by GBC. Southeast, unfortunately, simply does not have the money to work with this. The reclaim is not is sort of there, but the static economy just is not. So ultimately, Southeast is all they've been able to do this game is take out North, uh, take out GBC's economy, but not actually remove anything that relevant from what they're doing. Haven't been able to take it back. Haven't been able to take the Southeast. In fact, losing that, or Southwest rather. In fact, losing that once again. Southeast though going for potato power. Again, going for the big spider push. I really hope for their sake they don't try to push in as far. Like, if they take out this, this expansion they're taking out right now, rebuild on it and then try to secure that from there there's a bit of a chance to move in even though it's looking difficult a flank is possible here these are all slings they're they can be taken care of with frontline forces but the problem is that's not what potato power has been doing they're forced to do it now it'll help out a little bit but they have not been doing that they're trying to go in play it like early game 1v1 and that is not what this is this is late game 2v2 or mid to late game 2v2 I only say mid-game because we don't have any striders or anything yet, which admittedly aren't that popular these days. Still, though, southeast, I mean, we have data power. Actually manages to take that ultimately. But again, it comes down to what this weaver does, which is to reclaim. That is a thing I can agree with. Actually, more weavers in the bottom reclaiming as well. Southeast managing to get themselves a little bit back on track. More importantly, taking the northeast and claiming it for themselves. Slowly but surely, Southeast is starting to get back to the economy game. But in the meantime, GBC continues to apply pressure with the slings, continues to really press on, has the forces in position to take out the Southwest, completely wipe out Potato Power's Spider Force once again. Southeast, however, does have the Northeast to their name. Kingstad has taken that very convincingly. Also managing to take out a lot of Dying Friends Air Force. Whether that works out remains to be seen, though. It's looking kind of tricky. 
But it is working out, nonetheless. Or at least it's holding things off. But Southeast economy, ah, their fortune is turning. GBC managed, has managed to take out the Southwest. They're getting the supercharged economy I was talking about in the last game. They've got half the math, but they properly have it. They have the metal extractors, they have the overdrive on it, they got reclaim on top of all that. And it's going for more units. Not even trying to go for strategy or anything, just getting more and more units. More Ravagers, more crashes to clear out the air. More of everything. That's one cloak ball being the only thing really getting in the way for the GBC to take out Southeast, and it's looking like GBC has... Ooh, actually having some trouble taking it out. But Lego coming in to provide a little extra support, and with that, the Fencer should be able to clear out the rest of the... No, they should not. Same time, though... Flap coming in with slings. Smashing with Spider Factory. Should be able to take out the remaining factories as well. Potato Power trying to hold desperately onto their main base. Same time, Kingstad does have a fairly solid setup. Leeko able to get rid of a couple of caretakers, but not much beyond. However, that is it. Southeast throws in the towel. Dying Freund and Flap do ultimately take it. Half an hour in, and if I had waited two, like a minute, it would have been over. But as it stands, there is a very quick 10 times speed commentary. Let's return to the winner semifinals as we are now into Pudis versus Thomas. And Pudis versus Thomas is going to be. Sorry, not Pudis versus Thomas, they're teamed. Pudis and Thomas versus Dimefront and Flap. That's what's going to happen. So Pudis and Thomas, we saw last time, we were able to really make Ackland Wastelands work for them. But how that plays out, I mean, Subaru gets picked. I mean, for all we know, it'll get banned out by one team or the other. Pudis and Thomas will have the will have the first ban. And it, it would appear this is going to become same round, so. There we go. So we'll now have Dime Frame and Flat versus Pudis and Thomas. Also pointing out the lower bracket, Madcraft and Web Freak have been eliminated. Winslot and Magmen are moving on to the losers' quarterfinals, where they will be joined by whoever loses this match. While well, Kingston and Web Potato Power will be starting their own match against Steel Blue and Ted McFred. So with that, we should be getting to the map bands pretty soon. Oops. Shit. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, we're getting on to Thomas Brutus versus Flap. <laughs> and Dime Frame, Thomas Brutus getting the first ban. She's setting that up. Sorry, it started to. No, not, not you. Not one at all. Anyway, Thomas Brutus getting the first ban. And we will be starting out with... Oh. Yeah, actually, Dime Friend Flap. How does that work? Hang on, I gotta check the rules. Okay, let's see. Map pool... Does it say in the map pool? Lower seated.
All right, anyway, Vantage is the first one out. Which I'm not... I, I'm actually a little surprised by. I'm not entirely surprised because it is a tiny map. And Zed is out too. Okay, good. I can take like one Zed match out of your 2v2 tournament. That's that's about it. I am not a fan. I mean, the last match on it worked out okay, but it was very one-sided. Like, it was, it was finished five minutes before it was over. That is not ideal, but I guess that happens sometimes. Anyhow. We are moving on to... Oops. Let's show you the actual map bands. Got the third band. And yes, I have set up OBS in a way that should prevent issues in the future with forgetting to actually show what's on an OBS. It's a bit easier for me to see in my peripheral vision now. Anyhow, where is... Also, when I'm doing map bands, it's easy because I actually have to look at OBS to do the thing. <laughs> yeah, peek behind the curtain. Everything going on the map band screen is just OBS. I'm just enabling and disabling layers in OBS, and, or sources in OBS. I'm not actually doing anything fancy. And Akalon is out. Which means neither of these teams have an advantage, I guess? I mean, that was... Puda's banning it as well. Uh, granted, they did see how Flap and Dimefrid played on Akalon Wastes, and yeah, I can't say I blame them, because that's a scary map. And apparently Randy agrees with me regarding Zed. They're not a fan of Zed. They have said so in the strongest possible terms. Anyhow... Well, in the Twitch chat. Anyhow, we have one more band left, and Dimethroid and Flap get to pick what map they don't want to play on. Which I have an inkling it might be Lonely Oasis or Sparkles Reef. I think Sapphire Shores is going to be kept. But maybe not. Maybe Sapphire Shores... Yeah, I think Sapphire Shores would be kept. It's like, the possibility of it being played would be useful for Dime Freund. Sparkles, I can see taken out because it's a C-map. No, Crags is out. So we, in fact, have Lonely Wasted Sparkles or Sapphire Shores. We're gonna have a map we haven't seen so far this stream. Yeah! All right. That's some good map bands. All right, so Buddhas and Thomas have the choice between Lonely Oasis, Sapphire Shores, Dry, and Sparkles Reef. Considering the way they were playing earlier, I don't know, honestly. I mean, Sapphire Shores is probably the least useful choice because Dimefront and Flap are going to outmacro them, probably. Sparkles Reef is kind of scary in general because C, but then they might be thinking maybe Dimefront is not very strong in C, which... I don't... I wouldn't count on. And Lonely Oasis is a weird map. It's kind of weirdly amp-friendly. But also kind of spider-friendly, but also kind of rover-friendly. It's a bit weird. It's definitely the map that requires the least macro, but it's also something that might not appeal to Thomas or Pudis in that regard. I kind of expect Sapphire Shores, honestly. That just seems like the one that would be played. It is the most economically oriented. It's definitely the most team friendly. Considering Ackland Wastelands was picked last time when it was available, Sapphire Shores being a similar size doesn't surprise me. But well, I think it's 20 by 16. There was a suggestion to put the map sizes on this, which would be kind of cool, like put them up top. But that that's a thing the image doesn't have that I'm using. And it is indeed Sapphire Shores. The image that I doesn't using have doesn't have, and I didn't actually think to put that on an OBS after the fact. And sorry, Sapphire Shores is 18 by 8. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. Apparently neither Pudis nor Flap has played on the dry version of this map, at least. So this is going to be weird. Oh, sorry, no, wait, why does Dimethroin get to pick?
Oh, no, the, sorry. Yeah, time for and set the map. I'm, okay, I need to get some water. We're going to be what this winter's finals and then a break. I get some water and refocus because Pudis did choose Sapphire. Time for just the one who actually used the map command. Sorry. I. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. Anyway, we're going to get into the match proper. Because that's all there is left to do. Watch these two players play the match. And then one of these teams of two players moves on to fight Crow and Anir. And the other one moves on to fight Winslot and Magman. So Thomas right now is the only one who's actually apparently ready. Are they not? They're not plopping? Hmm. I mean, Buddhist and Thomas can go for some tricky things, but if they don't know how to play, they might go for something cheesy. I don't know if you can really do cheesy on this map, though. I'm really not sure. I also don't agree that Spider is mandatory. I think Pudis' assertion there seems... a little... a little sudden. It's worth noting that any bot can go along these paths. Uh, there are there exist paths along here that you don't need Spider to go up and down. But to be fair, Spiders are very strong right now, so... I mean, spiders have kind of been mandatory, period, overall. I would not be surprised to see spider plop. Okay, so we're looking to spider jump from Thomas and Anir. Sorry, Thomas and Pudis, not Anir. Anir's not playing right now. Eastern team going for that, and GBC has clearly just been doing some voice chat. So with that, Dime Friend is also going for spiders. And the match will begin. Dime Friend spiders, flap going for Cloaky, and we have spider jump over on the eastern side. Oh, spider shield over on the eastern side. So it's kind of like the 1v1 we had last week between, I think it was Randy and Golda, but this time it's the spider, the Cloaky spy or Cloaky Shield matchup is joined by spiders on both sides. Because apparently they're mandatory on this map. But again, yeah, they are they are strong. I can't I cannot fault that read. They are a strong factory. Also, GBC starting out very upfront. I like it. I think it'll work out pretty well. Eastern team, however, because the I mean the thing is starting up front means that you have a defender's advantage a bit farther up. And it also means that everything else behind it is just backfill. Whereas, if you're starting in the back, you have to fight to go forward, and then you have to defend it with your factory farther away. The upside, of course, is that if your factory gets assaulted, it means your opponent has to have gone through everything, so more of a defense and depth type thing. Whereas the way the GPC has it, their factories can be destroyed quickly, even without that. Ooh, Flea coming in here, not able to get anything on the convict, unfortunately. Did not micro into the shields early enough. I think it would have been enough. I think it would have been enough. It's very close, anyway. Same time, Flea's over here are finding dirt bags and not getting anything out of it. So, scouts on both sides. Eastern team will see that GBC has gone for forward factories in both cases, or should see that? Yes, they will see the spider factory. I haven't seen the cloaky factory yet. Looks like the expectation is to be up top. Which Pudis will very quickly find out is not the case. While at the same time, Pudis and Thomas have been expanding a lot faster. GBC clearly a bit more focused on getting early raids up rather than getting the backfill on the expansion. Though, again, this is really well defended. Like, this whole area here is well defended. There's 
once things get going, there's no easy way for the Eastern team to really stop that. So Eastern team kind of has a timing right now for the next couple minutes where they they do have the stronger economy and they can use that to build up more forces. Assuming they make caretakers or actually build units, neither of which they're doing. I'm not entirely sure why. Okay, well, if they, kept, if they have caretakers, which Buddhist is making Thomas, has just decided to go back do that. Then they'll be able to take advantage of it. But GBC, over the next couple minutes, will be backfilling and getting an economy just as strong. So really, whatever advantage Eastern Dream has will only last for so long. But they are managing to start making it happen. So there's something, at least. Still some time over the center. Bandits have gone down. A small raid wasn't super huge, but... Actually, it might have been super huge. Certainly was something. Buddhist still has the commander of the front lines. Still in a reasonably good position, though... A widow is a threat, as always. So he puts the commander. Doesn't even need a widow. They're just dead. I don't know why they kept their commander out front like this, but they're done. That was strange. I don't know where Pudis was paying attention to. Oh, the main base, I guess. Uh, that's that sucks. That is really unfortunate. But that is going to be that. So. Having lost the center of the map, Eastern team is going to be having a bit of a tough time actually getting back in this match. They've that timing I was talking about, that's over. GBC is backfilled. They're they're full up in their economy. They're taking the center as well, because why not? The commander's not there. So right now, GBC is looking scary. And the Eastern team, they've just caught up in terms of actual production capacity. Snitch coming in, taking out a few glaives. Oh, more than a few, actually. I'm sorry, this is going to be a bad... This is one of the bad matches where I don't catch any of the battles, and everyone is disappointed. I'm sorry. It happens sometimes. I try not to, but it happens sometimes. Anyhow, Venom over the front line... Or, yes, definitely over the front lines. Getting rid of all the Lotuses, getting rid of the Metal Extractors. Opening up the center a little bit. So Thomas kind of making up for Pudis' lost commander, and more importantly, reclaiming Pudis' lost commander. The Eastern team will be able to maintain their economy right now. Same time, though, more salts over to the north side of the map. Venom is over to the top. Getting rid of a few lotuses, getting rid of a few metal extractors. Though same can be said for Thomas' Venoms. Getting rid of- oh, nice! Getting rid of a Conjurer, too! Well played there. Contra down means that front line is going to be that much harder to rebuild. The commander in the back being safe. Same time, the combination of shield bot along with all these spiders actually is... That is something. Crab is on the way, but it's not happening anytime soon. The salt force... This is the perfect timing. This is it. Eastern team's going for it. Venoms are forced to retreat... Or Diamond Friends Venom is forced to retreat. Base is getting heavily assaulted. Manning Force is coming in. Getting distracted a little bit, though. This No, they've got to push. They've got to push. The Crab is not up yet. GBC is investing all this money into the Crab. Some investment has been shifted, though, to try to get around that. But still, most of it in the Crab. Basically, everything else is just a couple of Lotuses. And once the Felon Thug Ball comes in, there is not much. Dirtbag is coming in, also baiting out the Lotuses. And that is, as a dead Dying Front Commander, dead Weaver at the very least, Commander does go down. That's the opening that Buddhist and Thomas need. Factory is done. The crab has been destroyed. Lotus is down. Dying Front has basically been destroyed, wiped off the map. Flaps Commander coming in to try to save the day. But unfortunately, there's no easy way for them to do so. That factory is done. Time for able to at least get a little bit out of it with the Caretaker Reclaim. But it's only going to last for so long as Flaps Commander, also under heavy threat. Able to get defended by Knights. It's not over yet. But that Felon... That Felon needs to run. That Felon is completely out of ammo. It's doing work, but honestly, the main work has been done. 
Everything in the back is just finishing things off. Cleaning up everything. Cleaning up all the back. Cleaning up all the front side. It is it. And can we please not... Okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to talk about... I don't want crypto discussion in here. Like, that stuff's on stream. Like, if you're watching a match, spectating, chat's on stream. Anyway. Back to the game, as I've been thoroughly distracted by trying to moderate the game's chat. Yes, talking about COVID is fine. That's less contentious. Anyway, with... I am not joking, it is less contentious. The, anyway, the... As it stands, the game itself, I mean, I guess it wasn't really a big loss, considering that Eastern Team has basically just wiped out everything. After taking a Diamond Thrones commander and their base, I mean, Flop is managing to get themselves kind of back in position, but ultimately the Eastern Team has, they've got double the economy. They're holding this line very effectively. Yeah, I'm not gonna have YouTube comments talking about that. Uh, last thing I need is crypto stands in my YouTube comments. Uh, anyway. Where was I? Oh, right, yes, game. Or rather, Flap desperately trying to get out of this terrible situation they're in. Or Booz and Thomas should, should be able to wreck their commander pretty shortly. The felons got most of their shields back up. And that's kind of it. Yep, that is that. So, we are... We are looking at Pudis and Thomas moving on to the winner's finals against Crow and Anir. I must say, I am impressed. This has been a solid team. Both times watching them, they have... Especially both times, they kind of... They go economic, they get a little bit greedy, they get knocked down a peg, and then they proceed to come back in full force. Also, yeah, talk in Twitch chat. If you're going to want to... If you want to talk about stuff, do it in the Twitch chat. Don't talk about crypto in the Twitch chat, because seriously, I don't like it. It's for many reasons I don't want to get into. But... The... And yeah, I know there's some people in the Zero K community who are getting annoyed by that statement. Well, that's fine. Anyway, Twitch chat, please. Because it's also nice because it means that there's more people talking in Twitch chat. Which is just nice for me. But that's a purely selfish thing. Anyway. Selfishness aside, let's get back to the tournament. As we are going to be moving on to the winner's finals. And it will be... I think... I th oh, I don't know. I mean, I want to say it's going to be tricky for Pudis and Thomas, but I think... Okay, so the thing with Pudis and Thomas is that they're pretty even on Elo. And the that's kind of the tricky thing when it comes to all this kind of tournament. Like, okay, so here's the thing with this tournament, right? It's low Elo, high Elo, Elo. But at the threshold, you can stay even. So you don't have to, if you're low Elo, go for a high Elo player or a high WHR player you can kind of be even. But the thing is, if you're even, that means that both players are relatively equally skilled, and they're both decent players, then if they if there's a one really strong player and a weaker player on the opposing team, gang up on the strong player and you've got it. And Thomas and Pudis have been doing that. I mean, they went straight for Dying Farm, and they knew that getting Dying Farm out quickly was the important thing to do. They didn't need to take out Flap quickly because they can just fight Flap afterwards. And again, I expect we're going to see a near and Crow. So if... Okay, who's picking? Thomas and Buddhist are picking the map. If they don't pick Zed, they'll be fine. The other maps in the pool are pretty open, but Zed is the only one that's a little iffy. Although, to be fair... To be fair, they wish they would probably still manage to make Zed work.
All right, so with that, we're swapping into a Niren Crow, fighting Buddhas and Thomas. So considering the maps that are available, we have... So we've been getting Vantage banned out by Buddhas and Thomas reliably. I... I mean, Acklin Wastelands would be a tough one to make work. Buddhas and Thomas managed it against Steel Blue and Ted McFred. Another, actually, fairly, no, Steel Blue's, I think, a bit better than Ted McFred, but that was fairly evenly meshed. But, I don't know, it's iffy, because again, the point is to try to take out the stronger player. Sapphire Shores is good for that. Sparkles Reef would be okayish for that. Vantage would be good for that. Random Craigs, I think, would be good for that. Lonely Oasis, I think, would be iffy to bad for that. Ackland Wastelands would be difficult. It would be impossible. That's not how you play that map. Zed would also be near impossible. So Zed and Ackland Wastelands, I expect to be banned out. Or at least not picked. Because Buddhas and Thomas do get a map pick. Oh, whoops. I'm missing the... Oh, well, okay. Completely in contrast to everything that I had assumed earlier, Pudis and Thomas don't in fact want to play on random cracks. Despite the fact that Pudis was saying sad every single time, which I guess is a meme, come to think of it. They were memeing. But... Yeah, there's Crags out. I mean, yeah, it's worth that. <laughs> Sorry, a bit of a bit of a debate whether or not Crag should be in the pool. I think it should be because it's a really well built map generator, and it's done well in tournaments. The problem is that it is a very fair map. Now that's not a bad thing. It's just that when you're playing from a disadvantage and you're trying to kind of get get a really strong kill on one player, having a relatively fair map, especially one where you can't predict exactly how it's going to be shaped, that isn't helpful. Again, it's a fair map. It's a good map. It's just... And it's really good for 1v1. Probably good for 2v2 as well. But it's definitely good for 1v1. But yeah, it's not the map... It's not the best map for coming in and swarming out your, the stronger player on the opposing team. And that's exactly what Thomas said. Like, a near would get the advantage. So yeah, they would. Probably would also get the advantage on a map like... Sparkles Reef, Zed... Sapphire Shores, again, I think would be a good map for trying to take them out. It works against Dynefront. I think Vantage would, might work, but that's a, that is a knife fight. So I wouldn't be surprised if they banned out Vantage just to avoid the knife fight. But that does risk... Oh, no, it doesn't risk Zed. There's no risk. Thomas and Buddhas have map pick. They can do whatever they want. So all they have to worry about is whether or not they're, like kind of working around what they expect Crow and Crow and Anir to ban. Alright. Oh, looks like Randy is going to be up against the winner of Steel Blue Timing Fred and King's Head Potato Power. Not sure who won that. I don't know. Where's... I don't know what the result is on that. Sapphire is out as well. A crow does not want to deal with it, which is wise. Because again, that's a good map for sniping.
Oh. And also Steel Blue and Ted McFred have won. They moved on. They eliminated Kingston and Whip Potato Power. And they're up against Randy and their van. And we are... Wait. Oh, Zed was banned as well. Doesn't matter, though, because we are on Vantage. We are on the Knife Fight map. It looks like we're possibly going to get a snipe attempt here, which, again, this is, after Sapphire Shore, is probably the best map to do it on. Certainly, of the maps that are available, is the best map to do it on. And it's pretty clear, considering the picks. Like, they... Thomas and Pudis banned out Random Crags and Zed. Two maps that would make it almost impossible to snipe out their opponent, or to snipe out a near. And Sapphire Shores and Ackland Wastelands were banned in response, which are two maps... Well, Ackland Wastelands is more just strong macro map. Thomas and Pudis have done well on it. But Sapphire Shores is definitely a snipe map. But that left Vantage. Map which I think is going to be seeing a very quick match, a very quick knife fight match of Anir and Crow having to very quickly defend against a rush from Thomas and Pudis. Such a play would not surprise me. And Cloaking Hover from Mumble Clan. Thomas and Pudis, what have you. Okay, going for Cloak Spider. Expecting Shield Fencer. Not that at all. Dagger Glaive, probably. Yeah, this is this is kind of plot fact plot poker a little bit. Especially if Buddhist and Thomas are planning on going for a rush. Ooh. Cloaky Shield. Nope, Cloaky Spider. That's what we're doing. Thomas and Moody's going for Cloaky Spider. They're going for... Um, not a hard rush. Same time, the other side, Anir and Crow are going for a bit of a hard rush. I mean, Crow... Okay, they're getting that first builder, but then after that, it's just glaives for days. And Daggered Bolus from Crow. Thomas and... Thomas and Pudis playing the long game. And it's tricky. Now, granted, if they lose this, they still have the loser's finals to get back in. So it's not over yet. They probably will fight Crow and Anir again. Unless Crow and Anir lose this and then get eliminated in the loser's bracket. Which is possible. But so far, Crow and Anir are the favorite to win the tournament, I would say. I mean, they take out Randy and their fan... Dying Front and Flap aren't even anywhere near, and P Thomas and Pudis took them out anyway. So far, though, Pudis and Thomas are at least doing well on attrition. And Hover was a weird choice, as Chad's pointing out, thanks to the hills. Though it's maybe not relevant for these daggers. Unfortunately, three daggers can only take out, like, one glaive at a time, and they've gone down a hill. That is a hill. Forced to escape, but they are providing a distraction. Food is coming around the side. I have to be a bit careful, though. I think they're going to be going... F are they going to be going for reclaim? Yes, they are indeed going for reclaim. Oops. No, oh, just... He's sick. So this is, I think, what Pudis did in the last 1v1 tournament last week, in fact, was this exact play. Worked well, too. So, with that set up, should be able to start getting quite the economic advantage. I mean, already they have an economic advantage. And I don't think Mumble Clan is even aware of this. No, they've got to be aware of this. No, they have no idea. It's just off the... It's just in the radar shadow. Ooh, that is... That is painful. Not to mention, of course... Daggers, again, dealing with the hills, getting stunned out, getting ripped apart by every every bit of support force that's there afterwards to finish them off. Crow, however, is going highly aggressive. Honestly, too aggressive. 
This imp should be able to take out the commander once it's distracted. Yeah, there is Pudis. Pudis, send the imp in! Send the imp in! Oh, it doesn't really matter. At the same time, Venom is over to the back, coming in from Thomas, taking out everything the crow has built up, and the Venom should be able to finish it up. And of course, yeah, why would you do that against spiders? They have widows! Not to mention Venoms, but like, okay, a Venom's another problem too, but they have Widows! They have 200 any metal and your commander, your forward commander is dead. You don't go for forward commander against spiders. That's just an easy way to die. Which Crow's commander has learned the hard way. Pudis' commander, on the other hand, up front. A little bit forward as well. I'm not, not a fan of this, but they're at least tough enough to be able to survive this. Unfortunately, that slow damage... Ooh, that slow damage is a lot. That slow damage was so much. More Glaives coming in... Oh, Pudis has to out micro and near. That's going to be tricky. Thankfully, the Lotus is done in time. The reclaim field should be secured. And with that, Western team will have the economy on their side for pretty much the rest of the game. Bit of a raid attempt going over to the south. Mumble Clan looking to take out Thomas's commander. It would be caught kind of out, but not entirely with his pants down. The Lotus on top of just the own commander, Laser, would at least provide enough support. The Glaze cannot come in. They still are able to do some damage along the sides, though. This this is dead. This is dead. Venom coming around the side to help. There will be a lot of losses in the meantime, though. Same time, bit of a raid over the north. And more importantly, this reclaim field has been taken. Buddhist commander is back up and running. And the reclaim field should be taken soon afterwards. Oh, boy. Still, though, those glaives not doing bad on attrition. Mumble Clan... 1,000 behind, though. More importantly, the reclaim has been taken. Pudis' commander is healthy enough. They're confident enough to go for the reclaim. Have, I have a nice con conjure here as well. Unfortunately, they don't have quite enough caretakers. They will start accessing... They do have the storage, though, between the two commanders. So that'll keep them from accessing for too long. Mm, maybe not. Maybe not. This is getting close. That, that Weaver, I agree with the building power. I just think that they might want to build some more caretakers. And there they are. Thomas going for it, setting that up. Same time, Clave over to the north, because why not? Take out a few metal extractors. Aeneas commander coming in to try to defend, but Pudis is paying too much attention. Won't let that happen. So with that, Pudis' commander is... Well, they are taking out Crow's commander, taking that corpse turning it to the Recycling Depot, and making it into nice plastic cans. And also, army robots. Mostly army robots. 100% recycled army robots. Made out of 100% recycled army robots! Unfortunately, those wind generators were not well defended. So the Glaives, they got a lot to work with there. That Reclaim... That someone stuffs the Reclaim. That's actually... That was a really effective assault there from Anir. Oh, and the caretaker down as well. Unfortunately, there's enough caretakers. It's not the biggest deal, but unfortunately, that was a lot of wind. Fortunately, though, there was enough static economy, or not static economy, enough solars and other solid energy sources that it's not the biggest deal to lose it. But that's gonna be, it's gonna be a thing to go for. Still, this might be it. But it's the commander going forward. 2,000 metal attrition on top of the economic advantage they've had the entire game means Buddhist and Thomas are looking to take this. Again, just like last time, going to try to snipe the stronger player. The Crow, with that mace being a little bit of a pain in the backside. And unfortunately, not enough of an army to really make this push solid. Buddhist commander forced to retreat. Forced to retreat? What did I just say? No, Buddhist commander stuck. And dead. Knight's able to take it out. Unfortunately, not enough support forces. Buddhist commander does go down. Thomas's commander in behind, but it's not going to be enough. I think this is... This might be the mistake that cost them the game. Second shot coming around the backside with the Glaives looking to take out Conjures, taking out some Metal Striders, taking out a lot of stuff. Gla Daggers aren't able to stop them. At the very least, should be able to put a bit of a damper on the economy for Mumble Clan. Also opening things up with a nice distraction, allowing the remaining forces to come in. I mean, that support force should be enough to get get back on track, but again, Anir's Knights are a major hurdle to deal with right now. It's cloaked him coming in here. 
Should be able to deal some damage. Might be able to stun one of them? Stuns all three of them for 14 Oh, nice. That's, uh, that's them all dead. There it is. Thomas and Pudis are able to take this game back in their hands. And indeed, most BS EMP is, of course, the EMP you can't see. Thomas Commander Home for unfortunately still playing it way too forward. Knight is coming in here, and that is that. Thomas's commander able to hold the line while Pudis just goes around the back, running circles around the nearest glaives, opening everything up. Unfortunately, not a whole lot of of riot forces to get rid of all these glaives that have been built up, but I think the Venoms will be good enough. No, the Venoms, no, the Venoms are good riot forces. My bad. There's definitely enough riot forces. On top of all the reclaim being used, Western team's got their, got their energy back up. Got enough overdrive. Got it more than enough in the way of caretakers. So this is looking pretty good. I actually do. That's like 80 metal per second here. So this should be it. The Glaze coming in. They're going to be completely stuffed by all the Venoms. And that should be the game. Anir and Crow had a chance. And the EMP off... And the imp EMP took it away from them. Nicely done, Pudis and Thomas. Did not expect this, but they are completely wrecking the tournament. Absolutely running away with it. Every single game, there's just this really solid coordination. There's strong understanding of economic play, strong understanding of when to attack, when not to attack. And also just a strong understanding of who to target. Like, who to worry I mean, okay, that's easy enough. Worry about the high level player. That's pretty obvious. But still, yeah, Buddhas and Thomas, they, they took it. Solidly took it. Like, that wasn't even... Like, there was only one point in the game near the mid... Like, near the end where it might have turned around. And even that would have been tricky. I mean, it, it could have turned around if Thomas's commander had also died and then would have opened things up for a slow, grindy win for Anir and Crow. But as it stands, no. Nine-minute, nine-second win for Thomas and Pudis to land him in the Grand Finals where they just have to win two more rounds in order to take the entire tournament. So nicely done to them, and we'll be taking a short break for the time being as we are going to be moving over to the loser's bracket. Might be a bit of a longer break, actually. I need to get some water, and we also need... I kind of wanted for the loser semifinals, because both quarterfinals matches started like 10 minutes ago. So yeah, we'll be back to that when it's relevant. Probably in about 5-10 minutes, so stay tuned. I will be back. It just might not be... might not be the when we totally expected but it'll, it'll be back stay tuned <laughs> 